All right, everybody, this is Scott Campbell with Morris Home Inspections here in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, back uh, with another blog presentation here. We are discussing structural components of a home inspection as related to the standards of practice and code of ethics for South Carolina, which are written by ASHI. So as uh, ASHI inspectors, we are background verified inspectors. And enough about that. Let's get moving. So as I stated, we are going through the South Carolina standards of practice, and today I am focusing on structural. All right, so in a home inspection, the things that will be covered in the structural section are the types of structure, block, concrete, other uh, the types of foundations, the floor structure, the wall structure, the ceiling structure, the conditions of the structure you will inspect uh, the attic and the roof structure from inside the attic and crawl spaces is what we have here um, i've come across a couple basements but mostly it's slab and crawl space in this area all right so let's talk a little bit about things that need to be included in the home inspection report it's something that we call styles and materials Basically, this is me going through the home and explaining what everything's made of, right? So we'll start uh, we'll start with the foundation, right? So the foundation here, oftentimes when we have a crawl space, uh, it will be brick and block. A lot of times it's block. The older ones will be brick. Uh, if this was a poured concrete slab, this is where I would mention that. Wall structure, most of the time is two by four. Sometimes it's two by sixes, uh, could be larger. The roof structure, uh, usually find multiple types of rafters. It's probably no different for, for you. Two by four rafters, two by six rafters, two by eight rafters and plywood. Just a little note about this, this um, specific styles and materials list was taken from an older home, right? So it had a crawl space. Um, had a lot of, uh, it had plywood, usually you see OSB today, um, and notice it doesn't say anything about uh, engineered wood trusses. It should say stick built in here uh, because it was mostly stick built. All right, so now we have attic info. We're talking about basic uh, attic info. How do I get in the attic? Scuttle hole, sometimes you have pull down stairs. Is there storage available or not? Is there light in the attic or not? Is it a walk-in? Um, this one had a couple different levels of attic. It had a high level over the second story and a lower attic over the first. You could walk into the first. You had to get a scuttle uh, into a scuttle hole for the higher one, right? All right, so we had a crawl space. How did you observe the crawl space? Well, I crawled it. Columns or piers, it had block columns and someone had come in later and added steel posts that were actually on concrete footers. So I put the steel posts in there. What type of roof? Well, it had a gable roof and a low shed roof. Floor structure, what did I see when I was in uh, the crawl space? As I said, someone had done some refurbishment here. There had been steel posts and they had added engineered floor tr trusses. And there's two by 12, same with the ceiling structure. And then you also want to talk about the method used to observe attic. Well, the low one was easy to walk. The high one was very limited. Uh, and we will get into a little bit of that later. I'll show you some examples, all right? All right. So foundations, basements, and crawl space. Uh, I want to list some stuff in here, and again, we, we usually do this by, you know, just showing a few examples of some of the stuff that are in a report, right? So, visible signs of water intrusion in the crawl space are present from water stains on brick walls and from dampness. You can clearly see with the arrows that there is water intrusion, uh, and you can see in this slide how it has, let me get my pointer out here, block foundation wall brick foundation wall. So if you go back to the last slide, 
when we're talking styles and materials, that's what I was talking about, all right? I'm always going to put signs of water intrusion for crawl space. It's something that they really need to know, right? So then I'm going to I'm going to say I'm unable to determine the extent of the intrusion or how often it occurs because I am only looking at this at a snapshot in time, right? I'm not there over a period of days, weeks, months, or years. I'm there for one day at one time, and so I don't want to make any definitive determinations on how often or how much this occurs. I recommend further inspection, uh, investigation or correction by a licensed contractor or water infiltration specialist. That's my recommendation. Here's some uh, structural walls. Uh, a lot of times you can't see the structural walls, right? It's hidden behind sheetrock or plaster or what have you. But in this case, uh, I'm in an attic and I can see a gusset plate that's sheared and detached. That's a structural wall issue. So I'm calling it out. Uh, a lot of times when you have damaged gusset plates, that's an engineering thing, right? Because they're engineered trusses. You should call out a structural engineer. In this case, it was only one. Uh, it was on a high gable uh, in an attic. So, you know, a contractor should be able to take care of that. That's up to your discretion on whether you're going to call out an engineer or uh, a contractor. If there had been multiple of these, I would have definitely called out an engineer. All right. Let's... Columns or piers. All right. Numerous support posts and block piers in the crawl space are not bonded. In other words, they're not mortared together. Have deteriorated mortar joints. So the ones that are mortared together, their joints are deteriorating. Lean. Are improperly installed and should be considered temporary. I think you can clearly see that these should be considered temporary. And do not sit on a proper concrete footing. All of these are just sitting on the dirt. All right, so now I'm going to call, uh, who, who needs to look at this? Well, it needs to be evaluated by a qualified professional. A licensed contractor should inspect further and repair. All right, let's move on. Here's some more um, examples in this same crawl space from the things I called out on the previous slide. You can see they're not bonded. You can see some of the piers are deteriorated. They've just stuck little blocks and bricks in there. Uh, on the right hand side you can see there is mortar joints on some of them and there's not on the ones on the left hand side so there you go here's another thing that i think is important to call out um, you can put this in crawl spaces or attics or roof structure or floor structure it just depends on your preference uh, but signs of fungal growth are present on the floor system in the crawl space in several areas all right Clearly, you can see there's mold. We don't use the word mold until it is actually tested, right? So we did, and here we're telling you, we did not inspect, test, or determine if this growth is or is not a health hazard. But what usually causes fungal growth? The underlying cause is moisture, right? You're not going to get mold or fungal growth without excess moisture. I recommend you contact a mold inspector or expert which Morris Home Inspections is, for investigation and correct if needed. And here's a little fun thing that I ran into uh, a week ago. The one on the right hand side was mold, right? This gentleman had claimed that he had encapsulated the crawl space himself. And so there was no way the moisture content was high enough for that to be active mold. My response to him is, first of all, that is not an encapsulation. He laid down some vapor barrier and put a dehumidifier and a sump pump in. That is not an encapsulation. It's a good effort. It's not an encapsulation. Um, and this is, again, this will be up to your discretion. I sometimes carry a moisture meter that has a humidity gauge on it. I happen to use it in this uh, particular crawl space and the humidity was about 63 or 64 percent the gentleman claimed that there was no way it was above 40 percent and so i showed him the picture of the moisture meter right we know that over 60 percent mold's going to grow pretty easily um you know under 40 percent it would usually be dormant that's that's in typical cases i'm not going to get into the whole 
uh, biology of mold in this, but um, in this particular case, case, he was incorrect. And But my point in bringing this up is it doesn't matter to me if it's dormant or actively growing. I don't care. I see fungal growth. I'm calling it out. All right. All right. Here's some more floor uh, structural. This is actually a different project. This is not the same project as the previous one. The floor joists and areas throughout the crawl space show signs of water intrusion, dry rot, and are crushing at the bearing points, creating sags in the floor. The licensed contractor should inspect further, repair, replace as needed for structural stability. You can say integrity, whatever. I think these uh, pictures, if you're a home inspector at all, speak for themselves. Uh, if you're not a home inspector, boy, you should still be able to see what's going wrong here. It's pretty obvious, okay? So let's move on. Uh, here's a different one. Um, this is actually back to the first project. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. This is the second project. This is the one where the gentleman had specified that he had encapsulated the um, the crawl space himself. So one engineered floor truss and the front middle of the crawl space is damaged. Again, um, it's an engineered floor truss. So typically, you know, calling out for a structural engineer to prescribe the remedy is okay. In this is instance, again, it was one. Uh, I didn't really see any structural instability damage yet. So I didn't call it, I called for a licensed contractor. Clearly you can see um, the floor truss there is missing from the gusset plate on over to the girder, right? Let's move on. All right, let's go to some ceiling structural. So this happens a lot actually, and it happens for a variety of reasons. Ceiling joists have been cut to allow for the return for the air handlers Right, so on the left, you can clearly see they cut the uh, the ceiling joist so that they could put a new uh, a return for a new air handler in. Other things that I see is they cut them so that they can put uh, scuttle holes or pull down stairs. They cut them for uh, you know the elevator mechanisms, motors. Uh, they'll cut them when they've uh, added on to bathrooms or kitchens or whatnot, and they want to move the plumbing vents. Any number and variety of reasons that they cut these things, but that's a structural issue and it should be called out. And then here on the right hand side, they just cut one at the eave. They kind of tried to patch it together with a little piece of two by four or something you could see there. Clearly not adequate. Uh, so, you know, that's a structural issue that should be called out. All right. Roof structure and attic. We have a diagonal brace in the laundry room attic access that is not secured at the bottom. That, uh, that diagonal is not actually attached to anything. It's just kind of hanging there flapping in the breeze, right? So that's kind of a no-no. Uh, diagonals are typically there for a purpose and they need to be attached to something, not just sitting on drywall or in this case, cellulose insulation, which is sitting on drywall. All right. Go to some more roof structure and attic. Now, this is something that all of us have seen at one time or another, I'm sure. Um, and you, you again, are here into your discretion, right? There's no specific rule that says how you have to describe these things, but I, I do them in two different ways. So first here, let's look. You obviously have some wood slats on the right, plywood on the left. These are clearly two different attics. Um, the roof sheathing, in areas of the attic has some staining from previous leaks that appeared dry at the time of the inspection. All right, so uh, the one on the left-hand side, it had rained that day, and that area I could reach, it was pretty dry. Uh, the one on the left-hand side, the roof had actually been replaced. Um, the roof sheathing hadn't been replaced, but the shingles had been replaced. And I couldn't actually reach that point to test it, but because I knew that the, the roof had been replaced, um, I made an assumption. So the roof sheathing in areas of the attic has some staining from previous leaks that appear dry at the time of the inspection. This is for your information. But because, let's take the example on the right, because it wasn't raining that day and it hadn't rained in actually a week, right? I'm going to recommend that you monitor this in the future. Because again, I can only describe what's happening at one snapshot in time. 
That area appeared dry. It is stained, no doubt, um, but it didn't appear to be wet and it hadn't rained in quite some time. So I'm, I'm basically stating that. Look, it appears dry at the time of the inspection, all right? I want you to know it's there and I want you to monitor it in the future. Maybe go out there after it rains sometime. You know, we always have conversations with our customers and that's what, I, what I'll tell them. I'm not overly concerned about this right now because it doesn't appear to be active. However, if you have the opportunity to go check it out when it's raining, do so. All right, I mentioned this uh, on the styles and materials page, uh, which was limited access to the attic. Areas of the attic space had limited access and could not be inspected. Listen, we all know that this is a litigious business and you need to cover yourself, right? So this is your disclaimer. If you can't crawl through that part of the attic, that's a really narrow part of the attic, you're trying to crawl between uh, you know, the truss system and not cross insulation and not, you know, break HVAC ducting and whatnot. Here's your disclaimer, all right? I will make every attempt to get through any part of an attic that I can, uh, but I'm not going to risk falling through the ceiling or damaging anything that's in the attic, okay? So there you go. There's my disclaimer. Here's something I see a lot, especially in like condos and townhomes. Uh, that have firewall separations in the attic between units. I will call this out every time. The firewall in the attic space has loose tape seams, or in this case, the tape had fallen off, in areas that needs to be corrected for safety. A qualified contractor should inspect further and repair as needed. This happens here in South Carolina a lot. Why? Because it's hot and humid, right? And it's very hot and humid in the attics. And so uh, that drywall tape, it comes off all the time, right? It's But... It can, that constitutes a firewall break. That's a safety issue. It needs to be a summary issue, and that's where we put it. All right, so what is an inspector not required to do? It is not required to provide engineering or architectural services or analysis. I'm not going to do load-bearing calculations. I'm not going to get in your uh, crawl space and take geo samples. That's not my job. Get an engineer or an architect to do that, all right? I am a generalist, they are specialists. Offer an opinion about the adequacy of structural systems and components. Again, get an engineer to do that, all right? Enter, here's, here's one for your safety, C. Enter underfloor crawl space areas that have less than 24 inches of vertical clearance between components and the ground, or that have an access opening smaller than 16 by 24 inches, that's your and that's your little uh, crawl space entrance door. And you could make a determination whether you want to actually follow through with that. I have crawled crawl spaces that have less than 24 inches of vertical clearance. It isn't fun. It's hard to do. Um, but I'm a rather slender person. I'm not really that, that large. And so I can get through some of these spaces. There has been one that I could not. Uh, I tried and I couldn't do it. I just, but I, I'm not going to get myself into a situation where I get in and then I can't get out, right? So if you have any question about it, you're worried about it, disclaim it. Take a picture, put a tape measure up there, disclaim it. Uh, what I would advise though is don't use this clause to get out of something that is doable because you put yourself and your business in jeopardy, right? D. Traverse attic load bearing components that are concealed by insulation or by other materials. Listen, compacting insulation reduces its R value. You don't want to do that, all right? They will teach you in the ASHI school, um, don't step on the insulation. I will typically move insulation out of the way if it's not uh, real deep at a place where I know there's a, a, a floor joist, right? I'm not gonna recommend to you whether you should do that or not. That's something that you have to figure out for yourself. Um, but my goal is to leave things the way I found them. I don't wanna break anything, right? And if I'm walking through an area that is concealed by insulation or other materials, I might break something, right? If I do happen to move insulation out of the way, you know, that blown in stuff as I'm going through an attic, 
I am trying to move it right back into place as I come back through that area. All right. Again, that's up to you. That's a call that you have to make uh, in your best interest and the best interest of your, your company. So that's your structural. And that'll do it for this one, uh, folks. So you can find these standards of practice on the uh, American Society of Home Inspector website, www.homeinspector.org. You can scroll through that, that web page and find the standards of practice. Or if you want, I would be happy to email you a copy. Just hit me up at scott at morrishomeinspectionsinc.com. Send me an email and, I, and tell me you want it. I'll send it to you. And please check out our website as well, morrishomeinspectionsinc.com. Thanks, everyone, and I will talk to you next time.